1969, a vehicle entered service, which is quite possibly one of the most polarizing in the history of the military. There are a few people who absolutely loved it. There are many, many more who absolutely did not. The vehicle is, of course, this one, the M561, also known as the Gamma Goat. I have come to the Rock Island Auction Company. They've asked me to come down and do a video on this particular vehicle, which is available for sale in their September Premier Auction of 2018, should you wish to buy it. The product of a Project Agile. It was intended to replace the Dodge three-quarter ton trucks. But also, they've realized that since Southeast Asia was starting to become a bit of a hot spot, they also wanted the vehicle, which was quite capable there as well. In the end, about six companies fought for the contract, but two leaders emerged. One was Vought, perhaps more famous for producing the F4U Corsair or the F8 Crusader fighter aircraft. The other was Canadair, also famous for producing fighter aircraft. You can probably see where this is starting to go wrong. Both the XM561 and the XM571, which was Canadair's entry, were articulated cargo carriers, but Canadair's was tracked. In June of 1968, the contract was awarded to LTV, the Vought parent company, and Vought then turned around and gave the contract to Continental Diesel Electric Company, also known as Condec, to actually build the things. The manual describes the one and a quarter ton 6x6 cargo truck M561 and its related M972 ambulance as tactical vehicles capable of traversing roads, highways, and cross-country terrain of all types. The description is accurate. The GOAT part of Gamma GOAT comes from the fact that this thing will basically go anywhere. More specifically, the vehicle is a dual-bodied, aka the tractor and carrier, articulated 6x6 vehicle. Starting the tour of the vehicle as ever at the front, firstly, no point in rabbiting on about armor values because there is none. Lightweight is the name of the game here. Not so much in order to keep it under the army specifications, in fact, this vehicle just blew right through that limit, but instead to keep the vehicle light enough that it can float under its own displacement. Items on the front, nothing is going to be of a huge surprise here. Indicators, service lights, lifting hooks. This is your auxiliary power receptacle, AKA, this is where you put your jumper cables in if you have to slave start the vehicle. Blackout lights. And further down, you're going to have under the rail your little hooks there for towing. Now, notice how close the driver is to the front of the vehicle. The cab is directly over the front axles. Now, this has a good point and a bad point. The good point is he has a wonderful view of any obstacles that are on the ground allowing him to more easily traverse bad terrain. The downside is he has a wonderful view of impending doom should there be a head-on collision about to take place. Because notice that there is absolutely no crush space between the front of the vehicle and the driver's cab. Something to bear in mind if you happen to take this down for the shopping run. And so we come to the front wheels. They're always driven either in two-wheel drive or six-wheel drive mode, and, well, you can see from the configuration there, no great surprises. Coil spring suspension. The wheels are about 100 pounds in weight. Now, the full gross vehicle weight is 10,200 pounds, give or take one or two, and when on level ground, about 2,745 is carried by the front axle. Tire pressure, 22 PSI on roads, 18 on soft ground, and if you're in snow, it goes down to 12. As you come around to the side of the vehicle, you're going to see the 20 gallon fuel tanks, diesel fuel. They also form part of the step system to get into the driver's cab. There are no doors, you come up and over the side. Why add doors and a possible leak point to your watertight integrity? The manual does specify that if your tanks are less than half full, do not park the vehicle for an extended period of time with the right side lower than the left side. Because of the way the fuel system is, if you attempt to start the vehicle after it's been sitting a while, you're just going to stall out. Above them on each side are the battery housings. They're simply covers held in place with straps. Pull off the straps. It is a 24 volt electrical system. You get one 12 volt battery per side. As you can tell, not the original army issue. 
A jerry can is pretty much typical above the center axle, although you'll note it is marked water, not least because it is directly on top of the single exhaust. The far side, you may, for example, though, find ammunition for an M60 machine gun. The center axle is the one that carries most of the weight. When the vehicle is fully loaded, about 3,900 pounds. When 6x6 drive is engaged, the power comes from the transfer case to the differential on the center axle. It splits into three directions, the two wheels and then a power output to the rear axle. Now, unlike the front and rear axles, which are interchangeable, the center axle is actually a little bit bigger and uh, thus will not work with the same parts. Now this is where the magic happens, and it is where the gamma in Gamma Goat comes from. The articulated joint was designed by a chap by the name of Roger Gramount, and it was designed not only to let the carrier roll and pitch independently to the tractor, but also to avoid jackknifing. Further, it is designed to deal with the stresses of the driven rear axle. This isn't simply a tow mount. This vehicle will be pushing on the articulated joint as well as pulling, depending on the traction on the wheels. Further, not only do you have the power shaft going through this joint, you also have the systems for steering and braking, both the air and hydraulic lines. It's worth observing, perhaps, that there's two slightly different braking circuits. When you push down on the brake pedal in the master cylinder, there are two pistons. One piston serves the front and rear axles, and the other piston serves the center axles. You might also be starting to cop on to one of the reasons that this vehicle was not entirely loved by the line troops. Not only is it a lot more complicated than the 4x4 vehicles it was replacing, but when you did need to repair something, accessing the part was a lot more difficult. The rear axle is basically a mirror image of the front axle, and as you can see, they steer. The manual observes that when you are steering in reverse, you treat this basically as a 4x4 vehicle. You don't have to sort of counter steer as you would if you were reversing a semi-trailer. Further, because all four end wheels steer, the turning circle is a very reasonable 29 foot radius. As you come around to the back of the vehicle, you see that all the Pioneer tools are mounted on the tailgate. The ambulance version has an additional step on the tailgate. And you also have your standard array of reflectors, tow hook, the receptacle for the lights on the trailer that you're towing, and so on. And so we come to the carrier, which also came with a soft top to keep the worst of the weather out. When stowed, the bows would be seen around the front of the carrier. You could get a bunch of conversion kits for the trailer. And what you would do, for example, let's say you got the 4.2 inch motor conversion kit or the 81 inch motor conversion kit. These would provide mounting points for the tube, the base plate, and some of the ammunition. The other type of trailer you could get would be the ambulance. And this came with an insulated cover, an additional personnel heater for the rear, space for three litters, an attendance seat, and a bunch of seat belts. Now, when you're in the back of this thing, there's absolutely no way of attracting the driver's attention. So what they've installed in this little recess here would be a push to request stop button. When you push the button, a big red light comes on on the driver's panel saying, stop the truck. Coming around to the co-driver's position, the front fender is where you would mount the M240 or M60 machine gun if you happen to have the machine gun kit mounted. But now we come to the PS de resistance. Originally, this vehicle was going to have an air-cooled engine. It didn't really work out, though. Instead, what we have is the Detroit Diesel 3-53. This wonderful contraption would have 159 cubic inches of displacement. That's about 2.61 liters, if you're metric puts out 101 horsepower, 205 foot-pounds of torque. It is a two-cycle diesel. And, well, the main problem with it was it was incredibly loud. It became mandatory to wear hearing protection when operating this vehicle. Health and safety concerns aside, though, you also have the tactical liabilities of something so loud that you need to wear earmuffs in order to drive it around in the front lines. Now, you'll note that the cooling system is mounted very compactly together with the engine. The cooling system is 19 quarts. The engine takes 12 of oil. Despite all the other concerns, though, 
The engine was still powerful enough to do what it needed to do. Fully loaded with a ton and a quarter payload, this thing would still climb a 60% grade. The engine would power the vehicle along at a good 55 miles an hour, if you were courageous enough to do so, or on water, two and a half miles an hour, propelled by the wheels. Now, there are a couple of quirks with water operation. For example, the drain plugs had this nasty habit of leaking, and you always had to be very sure that you checked to make sure they were closed. Uh, perhaps not reassuringly, the manual instructs all personnel aboard to wear life preservers. In the field, well, the amphibious capability was perhaps more theoretical than practical. Give an idea of some of the problems. If you tried to put this thing through 30 inches of water that was doing more than 6 miles an hour, you had a very good chance of the vehicle simply being swept downriver. Remember, the thing is, it's a boat, basically. It's designed to float. So, yeah, I wouldn't use this as a commuter vehicle around maybe crossing the San Francisco Bay or anything. Once you're in the crew compartment, it's comfortable enough for a military vehicle, subject, of course, to the noise. The seat will move forwards and backwards or up and down. Pedals are standard. You've got a dimmer switch on the left-hand side for your foot, then your clutch brake accelerator, as you would expect. Lots of dials, knobs, and switches, and handles. One which is missing, though, would ordinarily be here. I'd mentioned before, this doesn't have a winch. If you had a winch, the power takeoff would be here. Then further back to the right, you have a parking brake, and now you have your drive selectors, your transfer case for a low range, neutral, or high, and then the drive selector for either six-wheel drive or two-wheel drive. In two-wheel drive mode, just the front wheels are powered. Now, they are mechanically connected, so if I was to go from six-wheel drive to two-wheel drive, you'll note that the transfer case will move similarly at the same time. It is impossible to go into two-wheel drive low. Basically, if you're, if you're in such conditions that you need to be in low range, you don't need to be in two-wheel drive. Now, that said, uh, the transmission is a four-speed with reverse, standard shift pattern, one, two, three, and four, reverse is on the left. Your layout at the front is going to be fairly typical. Uh, on the very far left, this is an air box uh, for heating in cold weather. Uh, so you would actually turn this on before you start the engine. Uh, underneath is the same light switch that had been at this point in service for decades and indeed will continue in service for decades. Fuel gauge, uh, speedometer, you know, normal stuff. These controls on the right, this is really for your motors. So the two on the bottom right, they're for your windshield wipers. Your bilge pump, which is important, <laughs> on the bottom left. This is the fuel cutoff, hand throttle, master power. This is where that warning light will come on for the guys in the back. If you wanted to stop the truck, the, that would be the red light and the starter. So if you wanted to start it, simple enough. Make sure you're in neutral for starters. Push down on the clutch. Make sure that the fuel cutoff is all the way in and thus not cut off. Maybe put out the hand throttle a little bit if you want. Turn on master power. And then you simply push the start and give it a little gas. Simple. And you can already see just how loud this is even before you gun the engine. That can get annoying very quickly. Pull the fuel cut off, turn off master power, and you're done. Finally, to get out, well, it's simple but not easy because this is a very big steering wheel and it just keeps getting in the way. Plus, there's no floor mat in this particular vehicle, so my feet have no traction whatsoever. But in theory, you just come back out and over the side. Come 1973, construction of the 15,000 or so units at Condex plant in North Carolina was completed. 1,758 went to the Marine Corps. The only foreign user, the Mexican military. Now, despite this vehicle's 
off-road capability, user sentiment was such that it wasn't really destined to have a long service life. Soon enough, the general runabout purposes were well enough served by the Cook V, basically a Chevy Blazer painted army green. And for off-road purposes, well, the 1980s saw the Humvee arrive, which was almost as capable, but certainly a whole heck of a lot more popular. Still, this vehicle is always an attention getter at shows. Thus ends the tour of the 561. Hope you found it informative and I'll see you on the next one. But there's nothing stopping you going into um, uh, six wheel drive high. Huh. Okay, let's do this again.